Need something to mix your oscillators together while adding a bit of grime and grit? Here's a super simple three channel mixer with built in diode distortion I designed that will make your patches sound delightfully rough. Before we can talk about the circuit's design, we need to understand what a mixer does exactly. Thankfully, compared to other types of modules like oscillators, filters and VCAs, mixers are pretty straightforward and simple devices. They've got one basic purpose. Take multiple input signals and mix them together. The result should then be made available via a single output. Ideally, we'd also want to adjust the individual volume levels for every input signal. And once that works, we'll talk about how we can abuse a couple of diodes to implement nice warm distortion on a separate output. To start out, we'll first take a look at the simplest mixing circuit imaginable. Two resistors connected together on one side. Send in your two input signals on the other side and you've got a mix going. Here's how it works. The two resistors taken together form a voltage divider, which might sound somewhat confusing at first. Usually, you see voltage dividers being set up like this, with one resistor connected to a reference voltage and the other connected to ground. If both resistors are of the same value, you can pick up half of the reference voltage in the middle between them. In our setup, confusingly, both resistors are connected to reference voltages, which also change over time since we're dealing with oscillations here. Can we even call this a voltage divider then? Actually, yes. If we simply freeze time at any moment, we will see something like this. Two fixed input voltages and a fixed output voltage. Now of course, either of these input voltages may or may not sit at ground level. But for a voltage divider, it's mostly irrelevant what the two input voltages are exactly. What matters is the difference between the two inputs, which is what the divider is operating on. Since both resistors in our divider are of the same value, that 4 volts difference will be slashed in half. And the result gets added to the lower of the two input voltages, giving us a 3 volts output. The grounded voltage divider does exactly the same thing if you think about it. It slashes the difference between our reference voltage and ground in half, and then adds it to the lower of the two input voltages. Because that operation stays the same regardless of what the exact input voltages are, the output will always be the midpoint between them. And that's why this setup works as a mixer. It simply puts out the average of our two input signals. To try this in practice, let's set it up on the breadboard. So I'll connect two jack sockets via 200k resistors and attach another socket where the resistors meet. For our two input signals, I'll use a drum track from my drum machine and a simple sequence from my modular. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, we can hear both signals in the circuit's output. But while this does work well when connecting the circuit's output to anything with a built-in buffer, like my audio interface, it will perform much worse when using headphones to listen in, for example. You'll barely be able to hear the mixed output. This is because this mixer is passive, meaning that it does not amplify the mixed signal. Why is this a problem? Because the two resistors strongly limit the amount of current that will reach and drive our headphones. In electronics jargon, we'd say that this circuit has a really high output impedance. To fix that, we'll simply set up an op-amp buffer between our resistors and the output socket. A buffer, if you don't know, basically just provides a copy of the voltage you apply to it without pulling any current into its input. This way, we reduce the output impedance drastically, because the buffer is able to drive our headphones directly. Still, we don't want that output impedance to be zero simply because it would make our op-amp vulnerable to short circuits. So we'll put a 1k resistor between our buffer and the output socket. This is low enough a resistance to drive our headphones properly, but high enough to limit the current flowing to safe amounts in case of a short. For our op-amp, I'll be using a TL072IC, which is two op-amps in a single chip. First, we need to set it up and connect it to the positive and negative rails. Then, I'll configure this op-amp as a buffer and give it our mixed signal. Finally, put a 1k resistor between the buffer's output and the jack socket and we're done. If you try and listen to this through headphones, the mix should be boosted back up. But there is another volume-related issue with our design. Remember how we said that our voltage divider is creating an average of its two input signals? While this does work as a mixing technique, it has a noticeable downside. The two input signals are always interacting in the mix. Here's an example. Imagine that signal 1 is currently active. We're getting an oscillation at full volume. At the same time, signal 2 is currently silent. So the input is sitting at 0 volts permanently. Since our mixer is creating the average of the two signals, the output will be this oscillation at half volume. We can test this by tying one input resistor to ground simulating a silent input, or not connecting it to anything at all, removing the input completely. As you can hear, the volume does indeed go down significantly once I apply the silent signal. This is not really great. Normally, you'd expect a mixer to give you the oscillation at full volume in this case. The state of the other signal shouldn't matter. How do we achieve that? Simple. Instead of creating an average of our inputs, we need to add them together, so that oscillation plus silence equals the unaltered oscillation. To get there, we have to take a slightly confusing detour though, turning our regular buffer into an inverting buffer. To do that, we set up our op-amp like this. The jumper between output and inverting input gets replaced with a 100k resistor, while we tie the non-inverting input to ground. Then we connect our two input resistors to the inverting input. What does this do? And why does it help? Well, first of all, it causes our output signal to be inverted. So the output will be flipped on its head. In isolation, this seems like a pretty random and useless change. But doing this comes with a sort of hidden benefit, which becomes apparent once we understand how the circuit works as a whole. So let's analyze this setup. To simplify things, we'll again assume that our two input voltages are static, fixed at 5 and 0 volts respectively. Now, since we've tied the op-amp's non-inverting input to ground, 0 volts, the output voltage can only stabilize if the voltage at the inverting input is nearly 0 volts as well. This is because that output voltage depends on the two input voltages. It works like this. An op-amp is a differential amplifier, which means that it amplifies the difference in voltage between its two input terminals. To do that, it subtracts the voltage measured at its inverting input from the voltage at its non-inverting input. The result gets multiplied by the op-amp's gain, which is a very large number. Then, the op-amp's output tries to set its voltage to the result of that calculation, 
If it's outside of the supply voltage range, it will settle for the last possible value. This simple relation gets complicated by the fact that we connect the output to the inverting input through this resistor. Because then, if the output voltage changes, this input voltage will be affected as well, which in turn affects the output voltage, which again affects the input voltage, and so on. We call this a feedback loop. That feedback loop will ensure that the voltage at the inverting input is always very close to zero volts. Because if it isn't, the output voltage will adjust until it is. The feedback loop forces the whole setup into a stable state. Here's how it does that. Whenever the voltage at the inverting input is significantly above zero volts, the result of the subtraction will be negative. Amplify this by the huge gain, and the output is crashing down to the negative supply voltage. At the same time, if the voltage at the inverting input is significantly below zero volts, the result of the subtraction will be positive. So the output jumps up to the positive supply voltage. This means that whenever the voltage at the inverting input tries to go above zero volts, the output pushes it back down. And if it tries to go below zero volts, the output pulls it back up. They are locked in a stalemate, basically. Now, because of this, we say that the inverting input is a virtual ground node, simply because it behaves just like a connection to ground, by always sitting at zero volts without actually being one. Now, why is this important and are helpful for our problem? Well, let's look at the rest of our example again. We now know the voltages at these three points, five volts at input one, zero volts at input two, and zero volts at the inverting input. Given these three values, we can deduct what the op -amps output voltage will have to be. In order to get the voltage at the inverting input down to zero volts, the output has to neutralize the current flowing through our input resistors. Since one signal is sitting at zero volts though, there's nothing coming in on that path anyways. So we only have to worry about the other one. Here, the relation is really simple. Our output has to pull exactly as much current through the feedback resistor as our input is pushing through the input resistor. Since both resistors are of the same value, both the pushing and pulling forces have to be exactly equal, just inverted. This means that our output has to sit at minus 5 volts to neutralize the 5 volts at this input. Now, if we ignore the minus sign for a second and check our two input voltages again, we see that we got exactly what we were looking for. A 5 volts output for a combination of a 0 volts and 5 volts input. So it looks like as if our buffer is indeed simply adding the two input voltages together, while well, also inverting them, of course. To verify this, let's assume that input 2 jumps up to 5 volts. Then to keep the voltage at the inverting input at zero volts, the op -amps output has to also neutralize the additional current being pushed through the second resistor. Since the added pushing force is exactly the same as the other, facing the same resistance, it will simply double the amount of current flowing, forcing our op -amps output to pull twice as hard. So we get an output voltage of minus 10 volts. And again, ignoring the minus sign, the two input voltages simply got added together. Nice. Testing this on the breadboard is as simple as connecting our two input resistors to the op -amps inverting input, while tying the non-inverting input to ground. Put another 100k resistor between the inverting input and the output, and we can give this a try. First, we'll verify that we still get a mixed output if we send in my drum beat and the synth sequence. And yes, that still works. So now, we'll see if simulating a silent input by connecting it to ground still affects the output volume of the other signal. As you can hear, the volume is not affected at all. Great. Conveniently, this idea works not just for two channels, we can simply scale it up by adding in more jack sockets and 100k resistors. So let's set up another channel. Yeah. 
And yeah, this also works nicely. But now you might ask, why are we not running into any issues here if our mixer is currently inverting the output signal? Simple, because with audio signals, this doesn't have much of an effect. They're going to sound the same. To your ears, an upside down square wave is still the same old square wave. But if you want to mix CV from an LFO or an envelope, for example, this inversion will become painfully apparent. Simply because it means the difference between an open or a closed filter, for example. So how do we get rid of the inversion? Easy, by inverting the inverted signal again. For that, we'll simply set up another inverting buffer with just a single input and place it between the previous one and the output socket. Since an inverted signal can be useful in certain situations though, it makes sense to keep it connected to a dedicated output socket where we can pick it up when needed. To test this, I'll simply route the first op amp's output to the next one's inverting input through a 100k resistor. Connect the output to that same inverting input through another 100k, send the output to another jack socket through a 1k, and we're done. First, let's verify that we still get an audio mix at the new non-inverted output. That seems to work fine. So next, we'll test this with CV coming from an envelope. For that, I've connected it to the mixer's input, while first sending the non-inverted output to my filter's CV input. We'll close the filter completely. As you can hear, the filter opens up in sync with the envelope's status LED. Next, we'll use the inverted input instead, while turning the filter's cutoff knob all the way to the right. As expected, the filter now closes down as the envelope's status LED gets brighter. So the mixer is indeed inverting the envelope's CV signal. And while our circuit does work pretty well now, it's still missing a key feature. Knobs to adjust the individual input levels. Thankfully, adding them is fairly trivial. We just need to set up three potentiometers as variable voltage dividers, also called attenuators, between our input sockets and the 100k resistors. The idea here is this. If we send an audio signal through a standard voltage divider, we're able to pick up a scaled down version of that audio signal at the divider's output. The factor by which it's scaled down depends on the relation between the two resistors. Conveniently, a potentiometer is basically a voltage divider as a standalone component, where you can change the resistance relation by turning a knob. This way, we're able to adjust the signal's volumes to any level between 100% and 0%. To test this, I'll simply set up three potentiometers, connect one side to the respective input socket, the other to ground, and the center pin goes straight into our mixer. Right now, I've got all three pots fully turned up, so we're hearing all input signals at full blast, just like before. But check what happens as I turn this one down. As expected, we're now able to adjust the individual channel levels. Great. With this, our mixer is now perfectly usable. I did promise an additional goodie in the beginning though, so let's go the extra mile. There's a really simple and nifty trick if you want to add some distortion and warmth to our mixer's output. All we need for that are two diodes, a trimmer potentiometer, four resistors, and another op amp. Here's how it works. After our mixer's regular output, we add in a 100k resistor, followed by a diode going to, and another one coming from, a 20k trimmer going straight to ground. That trimmer is set up as a variable resistor, so we can change the resistance here on the fly. Then we amplify the result with another op amp. What does this do? To understand that, let's first assume that the trimmer is set to 0 ohms, so it's as if it isn't even there. Next, we'll say that the voltage at our mixer's output is slowly rising above the zero volts line. In the beginning, the voltage after our 100k resistor will rise just the same. This is because diodes don't actually conduct below a certain threshold input voltage, 
I like to think of it like this. Diodes are essentially one-way valves for electricity. But to actually open those valves, we need to push against them with enough force. So as long as the pushing force from the op -amps output is relatively small, it won't be enough to open the diode pointing towards ground. Meaning that we'll see that force build up above it. But as it keeps building up, the diode will start to open, allowing for current to flow from the op -amps output through the 100k resistor and to ground which in turn will relieve some of the pushing force. This effect will only get more pronounced as the op-amp pushes harder and the diode opens wider. So while the voltage at the op-amp's output keeps rising, the voltage above our diode will begin to stagnate. This is why we need the 100k resistor, by the way. Because there is no limit to how far the diode can open up as the voltage increases. Without the resistor, we'd see the current ramp up exponentially until we've basically created a short circuit. Since this isn't particularly healthy for our components and power supply, we used the 100k to restrict the amount of current flowing. This way, as the op-amp pushes past a certain threshold, the voltage above our diode will simply stay constant, without anything going up in flames. In audio terms, we call this effect soft clipping, we're essentially cutting off any part of our waveform that's above this threshold line. And because the diode opens up somewhat gradually, the resulting edge will be slightly rounded. Hence the soft in soft clipping. As you might have guessed, the other diode pointing upwards from the trimmer serves exactly the same purpose, but for negative voltages. It opens up once the op-amp pulls hard enough, clipping the lower half of our output waveform. Finally, in order to not mess with this delicate mechanism, we then have to buffer the voltage here with another op-amp. Since the clipped signal is going to be quite low in volume, I decided to give that op-amp a fair bit of gain. To do that, we replace the straight connection between output and inverting input with a voltage divider. This will make it harder for the op-amp to equalize its two input voltages, causing it to push and pull with more force. As a result, our clipped output should be brought back up to the regular output's volume level. To see if this works, and hear how it sounds, I'll first route our mixer's output to another op-amp's non-inverting input through a 100k resistor. Then I'll slot in two diodes, one coming from and one going towards that input. Next I'll set up the trimmer, which I've already dialed down to 0 ohms, and connect it to ground. Finally, give the op-amp some gain with a 100k, 27k voltage divider and send its output to a jack socket through a 1k resistor. And we're done. As an input signal, we'll first use a straight sawtooth wave from my oscillator. On the oscilloscope, you can currently see the original signal from the non-clipped output. Next, I'll switch over to the clipped output. As expected, the top and bottom parts of the waveform get shaved off. You can even see the rounded edge. Let's hear what this sounds like. First, the original sawtooth. Next, the clipped version. While the two signals do sound different, it's hard to really hear it with a static tone like this. So let's try a more complex input signal like a beat from my drum machine. Again, here's the original signal. And here's the clipped version. Quite the difference. Now, you might even find the effect to be too pronounced. If you do, no worries. That's what the trimmer potentiometer is for. Because by increasing the trimmer's resistance value, you can influence the effect's intensity. Here's how it works. If there's a resistance between our diodes and ground, we restrict the amount of current flowing. This means that for the same amount of pushing or pulling force above the diodes, less current will flow. Resulting in less of that force being used up or relieved. So more force is allowed to build up above the diodes before we see it stagnate meaning that we've moved our clipping thresholds up and down respectively. And the more resistance we dial in, the more that happens. To test this, we don't have to set anything else up. We just need to fiddle with our trimmer a bit. <laughs> 
So here's the same drum beat from before, but with a varying amount of clipping. We can also vary the effect by adjusting the mix levels, simply because if the signal going into the clipping stage is more quiet, there's less of the waveform to clip off. And with this addition, our mixer is done. In a future video, we'll talk about adding more advanced features like panning, compression, and eventually sidechaining. But for now, this is all I have. In the meantime, you can find a bunch of bonus content on my Patreon page to tide you over. Anyways, thanks for watching, and until next time. See ya!